Good evening and welcome to this version of On the Sofa. We're privileged to have Kevin Horlock with us, affectionately known as Super Kev. So uh, I, as usual, we've got Vic Morgan on to do the interview. So let me bring Vic on. Hi, Chris, Vic. very good evening to you. Hiya, Chris. How are you? You OK tonight? I'm good. I'm good, thank good, good. you. Very good. Good, good. Looking forward to tonight and the stories that uh, Kevin will bring up for us. So, so without further ado, hi, Kevin. Hi, everyone. How are we? You're hi, okay? Kevin. You all right? Yeah, I'm good, thank good. you. Good. Good. Right, any questions, um, please leave them in the comments um, on Facebook and Vic will ask them as we go through or we'll have a catch up at the end. Okay. Okay, enjoy. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Kevin, thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about where you are a little later on because uh, you've just finished one Zoom meeting. You're now on another meeting, as it were. So you live on uh, on the internet at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, at the minute it seems that way, doesn't it, with everything going on. Um, I don't often do these interviews, and I am a little bit nervous, I must admit. But, um, I couldn't resist it. Obviously, Swindon's... Um, got a place in my heart i um, still got family there so when you asked me um i couldn't refuse well delighted that you're with us and uh, in tribute to you i'm going to try and move in the right way uh you've got we've got the shirts that you might remember that the shirts the sort of shirts that you wore uh there's yeah, the I black see and white castro one uh, there's the old round net one and of course the one in the premier league so We'll get to all those in a little while. Um, lots of messages coming in to say thank you very much for joining us. Tracy Chatfield uh, wishes to be remembered to you. Um, you gave her your Premiership shirt, which she cherishes greatly. So thank you very much indeed for that. West Coast Wizard is delighted that you um, talked to him about the goal that you scored at Notts County. He's delighted about that. And Leah sent a message in to say that he's once spent a very... Uh, funny day with you up at Manchester City. So already the messages are coming in. So thank you very much. Let's go right back to the beginning. Um, now, where were you born? Because it's either London, Plumstead or Erith, depending on which uh, your biography yeah. you look at. I was born in Erith. Um, we lived in London um, in a place called Plumstead, South East London. But for some reason, I don't know why, um, I've got a brother and a sister. They were both born in Greenwich. For some reason, when I was born, I was taken to a hospital that's no longer there. It was only a very small hospital, um, whether it was the the one that could could cater for, for my mum or not, I, I don't know. I was taken across the border into Kent to be born in Neareth, but um, brought up and raised in South East London, Plumstead. Well, that clears that up then. So thank you very much indeed. So uh, <laughs> dependent on which biography you read, that's the answer. So thank you. Uh, let's go back right to the beginning then. Um when did your interest in football start? When did you get interested in that round ball game? I think it probably stemmed from my dad. My dad wasn't a footballer, but he, he was a really good dad. And, and from, from the day I was really walking, I can remember kicking a football about. Um, the old, so I'm probably showing my age here. Yeah, the old cine films. Um, I remember watching as, as a as a young lad, and it was me as a toddler kicking a ball around whenever I got the opportunity. So um, I think it was just from my dad really throwing me a ball, and I took to it and. By the looks of it, I probably only used my left foot because that's the only one I could use. West Ham, then, uh, to begin with. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, they feature later, of course, in your career. Um, so how did West Ham come about? Um, West Ham was a club that I always liked as a child. My dad was a, a massive Cholton fan, being from South East London. So we used to go to Cholton to watch games. Um, at a really young age, I, I trained at Cholton. Um, and at that time, you could you could move from club to club, which you obviously can't now. There's, there's fees for, for kids now. Um, so I was at Cholton, and then Arsenal asked me to go to Arsenal, um, which I did for a number of years. Um, Travelling was quite difficult. Uh, and it's not until now, I think, back. It must have been tough for my dad because I'd leave school. My dad had worked a full day. He was an electrician. He would then pick me up from school. We'd drive over to our Highbury, which was an absolute mission in the traffic, um, and train. and then. West Ham asked me to go. I think I was playing a school game. Um, and West Ham, being the team that I, I liked as a kid and um, being a li little bit more accessible and easier for my dad because my dad worked in, in East Ham, uh, Poplar, sorry, um, which is, is on the way to West Ham. So it just worked better for us and obviously being the team that I liked. So yeah, I joined West Ham, did school boys there and then got offered a YTS, which it was called then, £28.50 a week it was. And I felt like I'd won the lottery. Um, yeah, it, it was something I always dreamt of 
being a footballer and then obviously on that first day where I become full time, albeit a YTS player and not a professional, it was yeah, it was a dream come true. You didn't make an appearance, did you, in the first team in in that time round? But then somebody called Swindon came and got interested in you, and uh, it would have been Glenn Hoddle who kind of got interested in you. So, how well, cool was that? Yeah, look that. Uh, look, and I use that now and again. Oh yeah, I went to Swindon <laughs> with Glenn Hoddle. But the truth of the matter is. Um, I did two years YTS at, at West Ham. I, I was developing really well in the youth team. I was scoring lots of goals from left back. And a certain John Gorman was at Orient at the time, um, youth team. So J John would have seen me and, and known of me. I did a year's pro um, at West Ham. I did travel with the first team once. I, and it, it was at Chelsea. I didn't get on or anything or in the squad. I didn't get changed. But I got offered another year pro. Um, and I maybe was was quite mature for my age back then in the football sense, not in a mental sense, but in a football sense where I, I see players at West Ham playing in reserves, which I was for, from 18, um, but they were 23 and they wasn't in and around the first team. Um, so I turned the contract down. Obviously, John had, had contacted me and said, would I consider going to Swindon? And I thought, yep, you know what? I don't want to sit at West Ham and be a reserve player. I, I want to try and become a footballer. I want to try and go to a club where I might get an opportunity. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't at West Ham, but looking back, it was the best decision I ever made. So I'll forever be thankful for Swindon and, and more so John Gorman. Look, Glenn Hoddle obviously had to say yes to it, but it was John Gorman that, that made the contact and wanted me initially. Fair enough. And, and did you know much about Swindon? I, I, I don't know whether you did or not, but did you? Not, not really. Not really. Obviously, being a, a London lad and, and Swindon so far away from... Um, London, obviously, as a young boy, you, you you hear about your Manchester United, your Arsenal, your Liverpools, and so on and so forth. I didn't know much at all, and I must admit, when I first drove down, it seemed the other side of the planet. But um, it, it was a journey I'm so pleased I made. Um, it was an unbelievable football club. I loved it from the moment I walked in. It was a real eye-opener. I, I, I was leaving a West Ham team um, or club that, that had Lou Macari and Billy Bond managers great people, but they were all about fitness. And I joined Twindon in pre-season, so I hadn't actually seen a football. All I'd done is run, 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 run. And I, I turned up at, at Swindon, agreed to sign, go to the first training session. I, I'm doing a, a, a rondo, a circle, which is a circle where one goes in the middle with a football. Amazed to see a football with Glenn Hoddle. Like, how good does it get for a young player? Uh, how does it work then when you, when you go down? I mean, are you still staying in London, travelling down? What, how does it work? No, no, I, I, I up to move. So I was obviously still living at, in Plumstead, South East London with my parents. And um, I signed, my dad, my dad let me drive his new car down actually the first day. And um, he had a brand new Escort. Um, it wasn't a big flash car, but it was brand new. It'd done 500 miles. Um, I had a bit of a banger, a Metro, Austin Metro, one litre, which my dad was concerned that he wasn't going to make the journey down the M4. So I borrowed my dad's new Escort. He got me insured, which... I imagine looking back now would have cost a few quid. Um, and I smashed it up on the way down. Someone drove in the side of me in, in Earl's Court. I was obviously, I hadn't been driving long, so I, I, I was unable to turn around and do anything about it. So I just continued driving, got over the magic roundabout just um, to the county ground, got out and yeah, the whole side of the car was written off, um, which wasn't a great start. But it got me to Swindon. My dad came and picked the car up. I ended up staying in Tiggs actually. I forget the, the the areas. I'm not great with areas, but I stayed in in big with a, a really nice family, um, a young youngish couple with a, a young girl. Um, I stayed with them, and they made me feel really at home. So I was in digs initially when I first signed. Um, yeah, a couple of messages already. This is from Mickey, who's from Bramblebury Road. He just says, "Legend." Simple as that, really. Um, uh, this from Aaron. Maybe I'll ask his question about you later, but give it some thought. How sad are you, are you to see? how far the club has fallen back to the level, of course, which you've got a championship, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So you arrive at Swindon um, and in that first season, the chances are that you, you play, don't you? But you don't play regularly. How was that first season for you? Yeah, just, just going back to Bramway Road, that, that's the place I grew up. Uh, that, that was the road in Plumstead where there I you go. With mum and dad. Yeah, Legend of Bramway Road. That's nice. Well, unless he was talking about himself, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, it, it was. 
I wasn't coming to Swindon to expect to play. I was a young lad that was cutting his teeth in football and um, obviously with, with Glenn Hoddle there and John Gorman that showed interest in me, I just wanted to come and train hard and uh, and try and get in and around the first team squad. That was my initial aim, to perform well enough in the reserves. Um, obviously, I, I got to play a few games and again, I always say it when, when I talk about my career to anybody or you need a bit of luck and that luck was, I think Paul Bowden got injured for a brief time and he got my opportunity. People would say, was you ready? You've done so well. I'm not sure if I was ready, but how would you know until you get a chance? So if if Zippy or Paul Bowden wouldn't have got injured, would have I been given it? Who knows? It was just a bit of luck that I needed to, to get a first team opportunity. I think it was a way to Portsmouth. Um, and it sort of just went on from there. I, I was thankful to get a sniff and then obviously that was... That was the easy bit getting the first chance. It was a matter of then staying in there and trying to carve out a career for myself and become a regular first team player at Swindon. Uh, I suppose uh, you're at an academy at the minute where you are right now. You have, and I guess that experience as a young player helps you talk to young players, doesn't it? 100%. But work hard. I, I always wanted to be a footballer. And I, I come through West Ham's academy and I'm honest enough to, to, to say that there was there was players more gifted than me, that more talented, than, and a lot of them, well, nearly all of them, didn't have a career. Um, so if there's any advice I can give to, and I'd give to the players here at Needham Market, is work hard. Work hard and give everything. And if you've got that desire and hunger to do that, you've got a chance, because I did it. Uh, obviously, we talked about John Gorman, we talked about Glenn Hoddle, but there were some incredibly talented players in that Swindon team at the time, wasn't there? There was the likes of Mickey Hazard uh, playing for the town. You know, incredible signings that the club was making. Uh, Dave Mitchell was there, sort of people like that. You know, this was a great time. This was building a really good team, wasn't it? Oh, it was It was unbelievable for me to go there. Mickey Hazard was genius. He was unbelievable. He'd obviously had an unbelievable career at Spurs. One thing, for me, it was the perfect environment for me to, to try and kick on and learn off players like that. David Kerr's like Ross McLaren, and it's it was unbelievable times. Uh, Colin Calderwood, uh, Paul Bowden, the list goes on. Martin Ling, it was just um, it it just was meant to be for me. It was a perfect environment for me to learn, and um, I'm like I said, I'll always be thankful for that opportunity and that development that, that I gained at Swindon. It, it was invaluable and set me up for the career I, I ended up going on to have. Uh, what was the feeling in the camp then? Because obviously it was building towards the playoff. Uh, you know, with Tranmere and then ultimately with Leicester. What were the feelings in the camp? Was it a disappointment that it wasn't automatic or should it have been automatic? What was your feeling? Yeah, I think so. I, was, I wasn't an ever-present, so I wasn't really right in amongst it. But being a young lad on the outside and, and playing the odd game here and there, there was disappointment not being automatic. But I've done it a few times through the playoffs. And, and I've got to say, if you're guaranteed to go up through the playoffs, it's the best way. Um, obviously, the pitfalls of that is the downfalls is, is you don't make it. But what a season! To to, to I, I travelled to Tranmere. I didn't get stripped that night. I was I was in the squad, and I very nearly got in the squad for the Wembley game. But I think Mickey Hazard was struggling, um, but he pulled through, um, which was a disappointment. But um, it was a really good learning experience for me, and we had a good night that night. So <laughs> f- things things worked worked out well. I think we went back to. Um, the De Vere Hotel in West Windham. And um, by the way I was acting, you would have thought I'd, I'd been man and matching the game. But I didn't even get changed out of the suit. Well, I have to tell you, I interviewed you that night. You won't remember this, but we had the radio car outside the De Vere. I don't you remember came... any of that night. No, no. You came out with a champagne bottle. That's all I can say to you. And uh, it was an interesting interview. That's all I'll say, Kevin. So, uh... Yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, let's it leave was, that now. I can't I remember much of that evening. But, no, but I bet I've you can't. been told a few things of, of Glenn and John with their wives sitting at the table in the De Vere and I was opening doors and the suit weren't fully on me. we just say that. But yeah, you'd have thought I'd got man in the match in the game. But no, <laughs> I, I was delighted to be part of it and, and I probably overdid the celebrations just a, just a little bit. Well, it was a bonkers game, let's be honest. If, if you were to pick, well, I don't know, the top 10 games at Wembley, you'd have to put that in for consideration, wouldn't you? 100%. It was topsy-turvy. Obviously, it looked home and hose and then the come back. And, it, yeah, it was unbelievable. It was, it, was, it was draining, to say the least, just watching it, let alone playing in it. Um, I bet there was a few um, chalk nails in the Swindon 
Swindon in that day. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is from Stephen. What aspects of your game did Glenn Hoddle help you improve? I don't know. I think he just gave me the belief to to get on the ball. Obviously, I come through West Ham's academy, so um, I was taught to play football the right way. Um, it isn't always, and, and and to be fair, football played on the floor isn't always successful. But Glenn brought that to Swindon, a way of playing, and he just gave me the confidence to accept the ball and and, and carry on doing what I'd, I'd been taught at West Ham. Uh, this is from Matt, absolute hero, my favourite player growing up. And do you know what? That that is um, a, a comment that I've seen a lot. A lot of people have sort of started watching the town in that era, and you were very much their favourite player. So I think you should take that away from tonight with you. A lot of people feel very fondly about you. Let's uh, talk about the Premiership season then. That magnificent day at Wembley. And then, of course, um, within days, Glenn Hoddle decides to go to Stamford Bridge and to Chelsea. J uh, John Gorman gets the manager's job. What were your thoughts at that time? Yeah, I think as a group and as a young player, I, I was devastated. Um, look, I, we, we all know that happens in football and managers move on, but with us being promoted to the Premiership, me personally, and, and along with, I suppose, Swindon fans, I was hoping Glenn was going to be there, certainly for that first season, just to head us in and, and, and take us that step further. So it was a big disappointment. I must admit, I, I, I thought John would leave too. And again, that would have been a big blow as well, because I've openly said it. For me, John Gorman's one, of, if not the best person I've ever met in football. Um, he's, he's, he's an unbelievable human being and man. and I, I was delighted that he stayed. It, it was tough. It was tough and obviously didn't end well. But that initial then going to Chelsea was, was a was a big blow. Because not only did we lose a manager, of course, we lost a great player. I mean, my goodness, watching Glenn Hoddle play for Swindon was a, was an absolute treat, let alone playing with him. But that was a double whammy in a way, wasn't it? It was a double whammy. Obviously, Glenn, Glenn's influence and experience on the football pitch was massive for us. And it was something that, in hindsight, we lacked. We needed that guidance and, and experience, which ultimately sort of caused us relegation. Well, let's talk about that Premiership season then. Uh, what were the feelings? Uh, this from Dave, top lad, top player, by the way. And loads of these comments coming in. So um, we'll try and get in as many as we possibly... And this one is from Pete. Could Glenn and Colin Calderwood, of course, who also left, have kept us in the Premier League? Because that was not only Glenn Hoddle, but Colin Calderwood, two massive influences at the club. So you start from that base, and that that's a pretty difficult base to start from, isn't it? Yes. Look, they would have definitely made it stronger. Let's not kid ourselves. Would have they kept us in the division? Who knows? Who knows? But that would certainly give us, give us a better chance to. So what about the feeling going into that season then? You, 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 know, you played most of that season, let's be fair. So yeah, what look, your, what your from, a selfish point, from a selfish point of view, I was so excited because obviously I, I'd, I'd had a few games of pre previous season. I knew that John Gorman was the one that contacted me to come here. So, I, from in my thinking, I was thinking, look, John Gorman's manager now. I, I could have a real fair, fair crack of the whip here um, in the top flight of English football against all the big names that, that I'd seen in previous years growing up. I, I was so looking forward to it. Nervous as well, because, again, you still question yourself. I was a young lad, and, and even if you're an older pro, I said it in an interview recently, you question yourself each season you've got to because that that gives you that edge to to perform and be good. Um, so it was it was exciting, it was daunting, it was scary at times, but, but f thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, up, at times it was upsetting as well because we lost a lot of games and conceded a lot of goals, but um, I think that season really gave me the footing to, to kick on and improve because if you can nearly deal with that as, as a young player finding his feet, then you've got half a chance. Yeah, Anthony reminds me, of course, Dave Mitchell left as well. Or is it Eric Clapton? We've never seen the two of them together. <laughs> Good shout, <laughs> by the way. Great <laughs> shout. Um, uh, so there we are. You're in the Premier League and you're playing against the best, Manchester United. The teams that you mentioned earlier, actually, you know, the Tottenham's, the Arsenal's, um, you know, the real... And, and the club had been through... An awful time. You may well be aware of this in 1990 when it had the chance to be in the first division before but that was taken away. So despite all the, I mean, let's be honest, there were quite a few hammerings, wasn't there? There was 5-0 against Liverpool, 5-1 against Southampton, the awful 
Uh, seven goals conceded at Everton. Sorry to keep mentioning this, but they were. Well, I think a lot of the people said, you know, despite that, Swindon's football w- was enjoyable and people liked watching Swindon play. Yeah, and, and that's nice. But ultimately, that's what probably what cost us. I think we probably went into that season thinking we could just carry on how the previous season had been where we'd, we'd entertained, we'd played really good football. We didn't really have a plan B. We, we wasn't strong enough at the back. And I don't mean the defenders. I think as a group, as a team, I don't think we um, worked hard enough at, at trying to stop conceding goals, which you just said it there. We conceded so many. And am I right to say we conceded five on the last day to Leeds to make it over yeah. 100, which isn't a great statistic. Um, we was entertaining. There was goals when we played, but unfortunately, there was more against us than for us. I suppose another problem was the movement of players in and out, wasn't there? Because... In that season, Swindon seemed to sign a lot of players, you know, who came in briefly, didn't make that much of a difference. Yeah, I think it was Frank McAvenny come in, um, Laurie Sanchez, Neil Webb, Webb come in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah Neil Webb, a, yeah. It was, it was a conveyor belt of, uh, of players and obviously it was, it was the club or, or John trying to find that balance of experience um, to keep us in the division. Um, and sometimes it can be unsettling, obviously, for players that you've got there as well. Um, unfortunately, it just didn't work for us. Yeah, I, I'm getting loads of questions here. I'm going to try and go through as many as I can, so bear with me. But this is from Marcus. Have you watched the Channel 4 documentary since it aired? That was about that season, wasn't it? The playoff season as well. Have you watched that documentary? I have. Um, I don't know where I've come across it. I've come across it on social media somewhere um, and watched it back. But it's just, yeah, it's, not, it's, it's great looking back and it's good memories for me, but it's just embarrassing because, again, I'll go back to that Wembley final. There's me on the coach singing and I've had a few beers and I think, oh, no. <laughs> so I probably won't watch it again. But up until that point, was was enjoyable and nice to look back on their memories. Don't worry about that. I mean, everybody had a great night that night. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, right, let's, let's talk about um, what is to follow then. Because after the, the Premiership season, you get a victory at QPR on the last day, last away game. At least it's an away win. And there was that night, of course, at home against QPR with that 1-0 victory um, when Keith Scott gets a goal in his debut and it's th- the first win in the Premier League. What was that like, the atmosphere? Yeah, yeah, it's, it seemed to be the longest wait in history for that. Um, and, and, yeah, good old Keith Scott, he he come in and well, I think he came in from Wickham, hadn't he? He'd done, he'd done well against us and, and John had brought him in. And, yeah, us in the dressing room thought he was our saviour because um, getting that first win was massive. And, and we was hoping it was going to be um, or propel us on to, to more or enough victories to keep us in the division. But yeah, that was a special night. So it's great memories, of course, for many town fans. And the, the Eric Cantona moment at the county ground, many will remember that. What are your memories of that moment? Yeah, I remember it quite vividly. And I've seen the clips. Again, it's a little bit cringy for me because I'm a, I'm, I'm a skinny young lad. Slick back hair. It's similar to now, but it's only because I need a haircut because of lockdown. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I just, I just remember... I, he obviously stood on on Monks quite firmly, and I sort of try and get involved. And yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it was definitely a red. That's all I will say. Um, <laughs> I, I remember that that game actually quite well because I remember going there because obviously I lacked a little bit of pace, like everybody knows. And I was playing left back, and um, I had a certain Andre Konchelskis who was rather quick, well, certainly quicker mm. than me, anyway. Um, and he, he he had a fitness test that day and didn't play, so Brian McClare played. He was more my pace. So, yeah, I remember that game quite well. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great point as well, wasn't it? Because they were the top team in England at the time, without any question. Yeah. So, uh, a great point. And there was the, the game at Liverpool too, when you came so close to getting a victory. So, there were some high spots. I've seen a clip of that recently. I don't know where I'm coming across all this stuff. I think it may be um, a Swindon site where they, they post up um, old games and goals. And, yeah, it, we wore the old Brazil kit that night, didn't we, at Anfield? Yellow top, and I think there's a clip. I think I crossed it for, I don't know if it was the equaliser. Um, I actually looked like I had a little bit of pace in that. So I've saved that clip just to show my lad. <laughs> pretend that I was quick. The, the inevitable happens, and you mentioned the 5 0 uh, defeat by Leeds, and that brought down the uh, curtain on that season. So therefore, you have to prepare again for life in the second division. Uh, John Gorman remains as manager. Uh, what was the feeling like in the summer that season? To put the wrongs right, I suppose. Um, to work 
even harder if that was possible and, and, and try and emulate what we'd achieved the two seasons before and getting promotion. I think that has to be your aim when, when you come out of the top division. You need to try and bounce back as quick as you can. Um, it was always going to be difficult because we wasn't um, obviously a big fish in the, in the Premiership by any means. So, um, but that was the aim, certainly from a personal point of view, was to try and stay in the team, keep working hard and try and be successful. Another factor, of course, is Jan Fjortoft. He didn't score, score until after Christmas. And then when he did start scoring, of course, never stopped. So if he just... Stop. Yeah, exactly. So if he'd started about a month earlier, there might have been a shout, mightn't there? Yeah, if, if it had started a month earlier, though, they'd have had to put a runway in on the county ground <laughs> with his aeroplane. Um, yeah, he was, he scored some unbelievable goals, um, really special goals, and, and he was a good lad as well um, and, and went on to have a, a really good career as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about that sec that season then. Um, it turned out to be disappointing, I think it's fair to say. Um, Swindon fans thinking maybe there's a chance we might bounce back, um, but it didn't work like that, did it? No, no, I think that was everyone's dream that we'd be right up the top, challenging, bounce back to the Premiership, but um, it, it wasn't a be, so it was a, another tough season. Um, yeah, really disappointing individually and as, as, a, as a group of players. It was tough. Let's go back to that early question because, you know, this is sort of tied in with this. Um, if I go back to that one that I found right at the beginning, um, yeah, from Aaron, how sad are you seeing how far the club has fallen? Well, they're in a relegation scrap at the minute. You're in a relegation scrap at that time. How difficult is that for a player and a squad? How difficult is it? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, I just think mentally, sometimes you, you go and you think, oh, we'll be OK. We've, we've got this amount of games left. We need to win this. And, and you keep looking at it in, in a positive manner. Um, but then you lose another one. And, and obviously, your confidence, uh, confidence gets knocked. Obviously, fans have got to voice their opinion because at the end of the day, they pay good money to watch it. So that's part and parcel. So you've got that to deal with as well. And, and inevitably, the games run out. You, you're looking for this cup final. In the end, you're left with with no games left. I've, I've had it a couple of times, unfortunately, in my career, and it's it's really tough. You want to do so well, and, and you're desperate to. And sometimes you can try too hard, and sometimes it feels like everything's against you. And that was certainly one of them seasons. And, and that is a big factor, I guess, isn't it? Because if you look at a league table and you're sort of the, not only points behind, but your games back as well, that, that's the problem, isn't it? When games are running out, you're two or three games back of the teams above you. Yeah, and, and, and even I've, I've been in a situation where you've got games in hand and you think, oh, that's good. You've, you've got winning games in hand, others, they mean nothing. Um, so it is when you're, when you're playing catch up, it's, it's so tough, and there's always a team above you that a nick a result, and it just knocks one step forward, two back at times. John Gorman ultimately goes then. What was your reaction to that? Yeah, I was gutted. Um, like I said, John, John's probably the nicest bloke I've ever met in football. He was, I owe him a lot, really, because without me coming to Swindon, without him showing interest, I'm, I may not have had the career I, I had. I'm, I wouldn't have got to play for Swindon and the teams I did. So I was devastated and felt a little bit, what do you do? You feel accountable as a player. I certainly did. It, it, it hit me hard, I must admit, because I was part of the reason he got sacked because I was playing in that team. So it was tough. So Steve McMahon comes in. Uh, what are your thoughts then? Because there's a, a Liverpool legend coming in. And like, you know, uh, we've had Lou Macari, Glenn Hoddle, obviously, Ozzy Ardiles, big names coming in as player managers. Um, what are your thoughts then? Because here's a man who's who's played for a very, very big Liverpool team. Yeah, obviously, I still had that disappointment of John leaving. But um, when I found out Steve McMahon was going to be manager, I'm, I'm, I was excited because he was some that, someone that I'd, I'd seen a lot of as a kid, like on telly, doing what he did. He had an unbelievable um, career. He, he had that aggression, um, which I tried to add in my game. It, I, I was conscious from a young age that, Going back to my West Ham days as a kid, like I said, there was there was lads that were more talented than me. So I tried to make a conscious effort of of working really hard, but trying to be aggressive as well. Um, so Steve sort of fit in that mould, but had quality as well. Obviously, so I was excited because it, I thought he was a manager that one could help the football club, but also help me on a personal level and, and be a better player. I think his first comment was something along the lines of, you know, there were no yellow cards. And I think it was at South End, wasn't it? 
or, or somewhere like that, where there were no yellow cards in the game, and that's what Sudden need more yellow cards. Is that fair summing up or not? Yeah, he was just a he was a, he was a serial winner. He wanted to win games of football. He was he was tough. He he trained off. He was a player manager. He, he trained like he played. Um, you look, you didn't want to, you wanted to be on his team in the five side on a Friday because if you weren't, you knew you had a chance of getting kicked. That, that was just how it was. And and I make it I make it right. He he, he wanted to train at a high tempo and 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 not just go through the motions. It was. I really liked him. I really liked him. I had a lot of time. I had a really good relationship with him in the end, and we spoke a lot when I was was still a player there. So um, he wasn't everybody's cup of tea. Um, there was players that didn't like him, but, but generally the players that don't like him are the ones that aren't playing. Um, so it is what it is, but he, he was brilliant for me. I thought he was good for Swindon as well. Um, it was what we needed. We had a couple of really good seasons under him, um, and he helped me massively. Let's talk about 94 95 of the League Cup because that was um, a great campaign, wasn't it? Ultimately, though, uh, on a miserable night at Burnham Park. I can still remember it, still hurts. Um, what are your memories of that? Because uh, you got a, a narrow win at the county ground and then the first game was postponed, wasn't it, uh, because of bad weather. And then you go to Burnham Park for the next game, which is a week later. Jan Arger gets a goal. It was nil-nil. And they hit you with three late goals. It was a horrible night for us fans. What was it like for the players? Oh, yeah. I was devastated because as a kid, you always dream of getting to a final and, and playing at Wembley. And that was our chance. Um, I, I, I seem to remember we had quite a lot of injuries as well going into that game. And uh, a couple of younger lads got opportunities. But you, we sort of edged towards it. And I don't know how long was left, but we were certainly in the driving seat. And... To lose, I think they'd made. I think McGinley come on and Pat Lynham was it? Um, they come on and changed the game and end up losing. I just remember going back in the dressing room and it was just silent. Um, yeah, I sat there for at least half hour, 45 minutes, absolutely devastated. Yeah, because Swindon obviously won the League Cup 69, they got to the semi final against Wolves before, and this was a great opportunity to get to Wembley, as you say. I often think back and think, if Swindon hadn't scored that night, whether you'd hang on to a nil-nil. It's one of those funny things, isn't it? It is, yeah. It sort of puts in the tendency, didn't it? And then they made changes and were um, through forwards on and become a real threat. And like I said, we were slightly under strength that night and we just we just didn't have enough. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the, my biggest regrets in my career, not winning that, that night, because um, that would have been a, a great day out of Wembley. Obviously, it would have been difficult game. I think they went on to play Liverpool, didn't they? Yeah. In the final yeah. and got a thump in. So um but it'd have been a great experience for, for the whole whole of Swindon really to travel up to Wembley again. So yeah, gutted. Gutted I was. Uh this is from Ben. What was it like to, to play with Fjortoff? Well we kind of touched on that, but you know he in Norwegian International of course played for Middlesbrough, for Barnsley, you know, and Sheffield United. So what was he like as a player? He was a bit of an unknown, wasn't he, when he came in? No one really had had heard of him. Um, yeah, I remember he had really thick set legs. He was strong. Um, sometimes what he was lost in translation. He had broken English, but look, he loved scoring goals. He was quite a good banter. Um, and he, he was look, he was a top centre forward. He, he left Swindon and went on to some big clubs and, and scored goals. So he, he was yeah he was good to play play with and to have that, that forward. Um, as an outlet that you know is going to score if he gets opportunities, it's always nice. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's move on to 95-96 then, because that has to be, I guess, um, the ultimate highlight of your career at Swindon, doesn't it? I mean, that championship season, from your perspective, did you have an idea that that was going to be a good term? Yeah, I think we we made a few, Stephen made a few sign-ins and um, we, were, we were a little bit younger. We had a little bit of experience as well. We just had the right plan. Um, and it's funny, you, you just get a gauge of it from pre-season that things could go well here. Um, and it turned out to be unbelievable, yeah. I'd obviously moved into centre midfield, playing alongside Steve at the time as well. I was scoring goals. Um, it was one of the highlights of my career that season, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I think I even scored with my right foot, didn't I, that ball away, which was, was rare, let me tell you, um, using the right foot. But it was, yeah, it was unbelievable season we, we were we had a mixture of everything we scored goals we were aggressive we played um it must have been a good season to be a Swindon fan hopefully yeah yeah terrific four league defeats in the whole season that's not bad is it 
No, so I'm going. So I'm going, yeah. Blackpool, you mentioned, of course, you got the goal, which ultimately led to the point, which meant promotion. How was that feeling? Yeah, it, look, we, 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 we had belief that we was going to get there anyway. Um, but that was a big game. I, I think, I don't know, you might, you might be able to correct me, but I think Blackpool were in the running for it as well. Um, so that result, if we'd have lost, it may have given us the jitters, but uh, we knew that a point was enough. Um, like I said, I, I ended up, I didn't score many with my right foot. I think the first goal for Swindon was right foot, actually, um, against Notts County. Um, and that's probably the only other right footed I, I scored. I, I connected quite well, and it was enough to give us a point and, and promotion. So it ended up, um, yeah, I had a good night that night, but it wasn't altogether. I actually stayed up with my wife in Blackpool um, with friends. So it wasn't, wasn't as mad as the, the Veer um, in the Wembley final, but it was still a good night. Yeah, uh, Blackpool finished third that season, 10 points behind you. Some team beginning with O and an X in it finished second with 83 points. You got 92 points, which is a terrific total. Um, and also, you had a decent cut run that year, didn't you? Um, getting to the fifth round. I've got to mention the Oldham game to you, which we won 1-0 late on with Martin Ling's goal. But didn't we have a penalty in that match? I can't remember. I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I missed a few penalties. Oh, I never, that's what you're getting at. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I missed a few penalties. I, I was always confident. It's funny, like, I was always confident to take penalties. And even after leaving to an I've, I've missed penalties. I always say it to the lads I coach now, don't be nervous when we've been in penalty shootouts. Just focus, hit the target, make the keeper make a save. I can live with that if you hit the target. If you miss the target, then it's debatable. But um, yeah, I missed a few. I missed a few. The, the biggest advice I would give to anyone is don't change your mind. The ones I missed, and, and probably on that night, I run up with the intention of going left, and I change my mind right down the middle, smash it, face it, and in the end, you do none of them. Um, so, but but I knew Lingy would get me out of trouble anyway, so it wasn't any yeah, problem. It was a great goal, and of course, it meant a few days later um, you played Southampton at home, and. Having said you missed that penalty in that Oldham game, you scored an absolute crap. Hang on a minute. Team. What's that? That was with a right foot as well, wasn't it? It was a fabulous. It goal. was. Yes. Maybe yes. I'm doing myself an injury. Maybe I'm right footed, but just didn't use it enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember it. Yeah, it was. I've, I've seen the clip of that, and it was team play. We were a decent footballing team, and and obviously Southampton were a Premiership team, so it was a big day for us. Not just to try and get through the cup tie, but to prove that we were, we were a good footballing team. And I think the ball got played square. It went into a front man, laid back, and, and I used my electric pace to run forward. And the ball just landed on a plate for me. Um, and I just threw the swinger at it. And lucky it went in the far corner. And then I did a stupid celebration where I ran towards the big stand at Swindon and, and sort of fell over stupidly and nearly dislocated my arm. I, I've got to say also, Wayne Allison landed on top of you. What was that like? That wasn't very nice. <laughs> um, Wayne Allison was a big top fella by the way uh, Wayne Allison and, and he was a great centre forward for us he scored lots of goals and he was really good to have in the dressing room but he's, he's not, it's not ideal with him jumping on top of you let me tell you I think you do yourself a disservice with that goal because well actually it's a really really good finish and you know if you want to show your youngsters how to finish a ball when you're put clean through you should show them that because it's a really smart piece of finishing yeah, yeah, he, he does look that. I will give you that. I've watched it back, and I, I sometimes think, is that me actually doing that? But um, yeah, if it was on my left and I did the same, I'd say, yeah, I knew what I was doing. I knew because it's just different. I wouldn't I, look. I hit the target. Um, the keeper went down. Did I mean to lift it over him slightly? Probably not. If I'm totally honest, but I hit the target, which is um, which is good for me with my right foot. <laughs> Terrific. I mean, that, that you've got 16 goals in that season, which, uh, you know, for a midfielder, that's a pretty decent return, isn't it? Yeah, it was just one of them seasons where, um, I don't know, it just happened for me. Everything that landed at my feet seemed to go in, whether that was the right foot that we just spoke about, headers. It just it was a real purple patch season for me. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the most treasured goals I scored were, were against Bristol Rovers, if I'm, I'm totally honest. Um, a hat trick, which was not really normal stuff that you hear from midfielders, but again, it was that sort of season, left foot, right foot, header, and it was really important to me them goals because um, my father-in-law had passed away the week before, um, so that was a special, special day for me as well at Bristol Rovers. Yeah, interesting you should say that because Tim 
has sent this message in. Did Kevin ever score a better hat trick than the one at Bristol Rovers, left foot, right foot header? So there you are. Yeah, it, it was. And again, I, I've seen clips of them. Um, the first one I caught really well. I've caught a few of them in my career on my left. Um, the right foot, I got a little bit lucky where I nicked it off the keeper and there was no one in goal. So that, look, it was missable with my right foot, trust me. But I was able to just um, roll it home. And I think that the header was me just gambling, really, getting across the front post. I think Steve Finney, we, we broke counter-attacked and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have a gamble and, and get up the pitch. And yeah, the ball just come to me. So it was lucky. But it was, yeah, like I say, it was special because of, of my father-in-law, Pete, had passed away. So I sort of dedicated that to him. Yeah, sure. Um, this from Anthony. Um, Anthony was at Allen Road in the Premier League. Lost 3-0. Kevin hit an amazing volley which came off the post bar. Do you remember that one? Mm. I would have struggled to remember the goal, let alone hitting the post. <laughs> I would have forgot about that straight away. Fair enough. I'll take uh, it. Look, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, this is from Adam uh, and the regulars at Route 66. Do you remember them at all? I, I I remember the Route 66, let me tell you. I had a many a good night in there. Um, not I can remember many of them. I was a young lad. I was I was doing what I loved, play football, and, and I enjoyed myself now and again. Um, yeah, Route 66 was the place to be at the time. Excellent. Uh, all sorts of questions about who was the best manager uh, that you ever played under. And uh, I'm just trying to scroll back to them. So please, yeah, was Glenn Hoddle the best manager you played under? Uh, and another one about Manchester City, which we'll get on to in a moment. But what about Glenn Hoddle as a manager? What, my best manager at Swindon? Yeah, well, in your career, would you say? This is what the question is, uh, I guess. That, that, is, that is really tough. I, I, I've liked... That's from Ross, by the way. Yeah, I've liked all my managers bar one. And... and I won't say who, and it wasn't at Swindon, by the way. Um, but I've been lucky enough to have really good managers. Glenn being one, Steve McMahon, Joe Royal, John Gorman, Kevin Keegan. The list goes on and on. Um, so to pick one out, obviously Frank Clark took me to Manchester City, would be really tough. I've enjoyed all of them. And, and today I took little bits from, from all of them um, and try and use bits that, that I really liked the way they were, whether it be man management, whether it be sessions, whether it be um, the way they spoke to players at half. I'll take little snippets of, of all of them, um, bar one. Uh, we should say, of course, international football came calling um, mm. at this time. Um, Northern Ireland. So uh, where's the Northern Ireland connection? It, it's, it's funny, actually. Um, I, I still remember it. John Gorman called me into the office and said, look, um, we've had phone call off. Um, Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, they wouldn't used to go and represent them. Um, so I had a decision to make. My grandparents, my, my granddad was from um, Dublin and my nan was from Belfast, which was quite unusual back then. Um, so I had a decision to make and decided to opt with Northern Ireland. Um, it was something I loved, albeit I'm, I don't sound Irish, obviously, although I do like a Guinness. Um, it was great for me and I, I'm proud of where my family or grandparents are from and whenever I pulled that green shirt on I give everything and I think that's what I did throughout my career I, and, and probably why fans from the clubs I played played at sort of took to me a little bit because look, I wasn't the most talented lad that ever played for their football club but I always give everything I always did for Northern Ireland it was it was tough because we wasn't the greatest nation in the world we all was always drawn against the top nations being low ranked so I got to travel the world. I got to play against the likes of Italy, Germany, Spain. The list goes on and on. I, I was, I was lucky, and 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 feel very privileged to have pulled on the Northern Ireland chat. Well, you say you were lucky. Over thirty appearances for your country. That's that's not to be sneezed at, is it? No, and it, and it really should have and could have been more. Um, I, I sort of retired from, from international um, games quite early due to. My wife was, was pregnant and, and really ill at the time, so it was tough for me to, to keep going away. And obviously, I had a really young family that I was going away for two weeks at a time. And, and I just wanted to be at home more. I was getting older and I wanted to concentrate on, on playing for Manchester City on a more regular basis because it was tough because I was going away and then sometimes coming back and not getting in the team um, if they had won games when I was away. So it, it was a decision I, I didn't take lightly, but it was done with the right intentions. Obviously, I, I just wanted to be home for my wife and young children. Well, that's fair enough. Um, you mentioned Frank Clark. You were his first signing for Manchester City. Your time at Swindon 
comes to an end and you go to um, Main Road, I guess, at the time, because this is not the Man City that many younger fans will know about. This is no, the no. Man City that, you know, were at a much more humble level. When you first went to Main Road, what were your thoughts? You know, it's funny because um, we would played Wolves, I think, my, was my last game on the midweek. And I knew there was interest. Like I said, I had, I'd had um, a really good relationship with Steve McMahon and he used to tell me, look, there's real big interest in you. And he used to name the clubs on, on, a, on a match day. I said, look, there we not, I don't know, maybe he was just saying, look, this is the opportunity. I didn't realise, I, I, I thought I was getting offered a new contract at Swindon. And by the way, I've never had any intention of leaving any football club I've been at, um, apart from West Ham. And I'll explain that a yeah. bit later. But yeah. I, I never had any intention of leaving Swindon. I, I never felt like that as a player. I never thought, right, I want to move on to bigger and better. I always was in the moment. I, look, I'm a Swindon. So I was thought I was getting offered a new contract. I wasn't on massive money by any means. Um, and I went in to, to speak to the chairman at the time. And instead of offering me a new contract in terms of better terms, they just offered me an extension, which I didn't really understand at the time. I didn't question it. Obviously, I just thought, right, that's fair enough. Walked out, obviously didn't sign the extension. Um, and, and it isn't until later that I realised that the club was in a little bit of bother and, and needed finances. Um, and probably at the time I was probably the most sellable asset um, without even realising it myself. I was just playing football and, and enjoying playing for Swindon. But I remember playing Wolves. I didn't feel great, actually. And I was at home. I lived in Quick Play at the time with my wife and, and um, I, think I had one daughter at the time, possibly two, two. And phone call, my phone went and it was Steve McMahon. And he said, look, there's been a couple of offers for you. I think Birmingham had offered a million and Manchester City have offered 1.5. Um, I said to Steve then, I said, look, is there any more? He said, not at this moment in time. He said, but if I was you, I'd get yourself up to Main Road. He said, it's an unbelievable football club. Go and speak to them. So I weren't feeling great. So I've just basically put a suit on, I put a collar and tie on. Jumped in my, I had a sponsored Mazda at the time, actually, with my name down the side, a white one, which were, was kindly donated from the Mazda. So you look just around the corner from the county ground. So I dumped in my white Mazda with Kevin Orlock, Twindon Town, written down the side, up the M6, um, got halfway up there. Steve McMahon rang me, rang me and said, Look, are you on your way? I said, Yeah. He said, Keep it quiet. He said, Because we don't want obviously everybody knowing that you're speaking to them. I said, it's a bit late now. I'm on the M6 with my name written down the side, heading to the main <laughs> row. Um, but I, I met Frank Clark and, and Franny Lee, who was the chairman at the time at Mottram Hall Hotel. Um, they wind and dine me um, and agreed to sign. Again, it was never going to be an issue. I was never, I was never about the money. I, they could have offered me £50 more than Swindon. I was, I was going to go because I wanted to obviously progress, but it wasn't about the money. So um, I, I agreed to sign that night. I went back to my room in Mottram Hall Hotel as a Manchester City player. Um, had the biggest suite you've ever seen. Honestly, I had a dining room, I had jacuzzi bathroom, four poster bed. Um, and I remember, I remember vividly, and I know it's showing me age a bit, I remember putting the TV on and it was teletext. And all I remember seeing is um, Swindon Star signed for Manchester City. And just as I went to press on it and read it, it flicked off it. So I had to wait about six minutes for it to come back around. <laughs> um, and that was the first time I actually see the fee. Uh, and, and it sort of, I sat on the bed and I thought, they've just paid one and a half million pounds for me. It proper shocked me a little bit, I must admit. Um, but yeah, that was it. I was, I was gutted to leave Swindon because, I've, like I say, I've still got family there now. It was a real special place for me, but I was excited for the next chapter. So um, did you have an agent at that time? Do you know what? I, I didn't. I, I, I've never really had an agent. I um like I said I I went in and just signed whatever I got offered normally I, I took the PFA with me because someone said I should but it was never going to be look I want this I want that it was very much what we're offering you and yeah I'll sign it where do I sign so I went to training the next day had a minute sorry I signed that night when I had a medical the next day went and trained for the first time at Manchester City and we had Oxford we had Oxford away first game on Saturday so I went back to my hotel um. To, to, to what I thought was going to be my suite, but I, I sort of went to the to the desk and said, "Oh, Kev Hall, up Manchester City, uh, giving it the big and a little bit." Um, she gave me a key. She went, "Oh, you've changed rooms." I thought oh, I must be in a bigger suite now. I'm fully signed. But no, no, no. I'd gone the other way. I was now <laughs> in a room. I was in a room where I could actually run the bath while I was laying on my bed. So the 
the good life had finished. I was then a Man City player, and I travelled home actually that evening to, to Swindon to, to obviously see the, the wife and the, and the kids, and then headed off to Oxford for my debut, which, which was quite amusing. I got a little bit of stick, I must admit. You won 4 1 though, didn't you? We, yeah, we battered them. That's, yeah, uh, that's, good man. That's light, light work's not hard, that is it? <laughs> um, but then, didn't you score your first City goal against a team called Swindon? Is that right? I did, I did, yeah. I did. And look, it's, it's difficult for me. And, and again, I have seen the goal. I think I think it was a header, wasn't it? it, it, it I headed it because I didn't want to use my right foot. It, it's what the cross come in. Um, and I headed it. I had grass in my teeth and everything. And obviously, I I celebrated. And, and I, I've, done a, I've, I've done a debate on this. Um, should have I celebrated? Should have I not? Look, Swindon will always have a special place in my heart. And, and I'll openly say it. And, and I honestly mean that. But scoring a goal for my new club, I'm sorry, I'm celebrating. And and yeah. I, I didn't go over the top, I don't think. And, and maybe some will say I did. It, it wasn't nothing about being against Swindon, if I'm totally honest. I, I, I was joining Manchester City and obviously I wanted to do well and make a good impression. It just happened to be Swindon that I scored against, unfortunately. I think you've been forgiven. It's OK. Um, right. 200 and odd league and cup games for Manchester City this at a time when you know as we said uh, they're not the biggest team in the world um, but there was that extraordinary playoff final against Gillingham wasn't there at Wembley where 2-0 down with the last few minutes and then Nicky Weaver becomes the hero it was an extraordinary game wasn't it yeah it was one of, well it's the first time I've, said, I've heard someone say Nicky Weaver was a hero normally it's Paul Dickoff um, I, I get what you're saying because obviously the penalties but I've said in many an interview let me tell you now, I would have saved the penalties that Nick saved that day. They, they Gillian and were awful penalties. Um, a fair place, he was a great lad, Nick. Um, yeah, it was a top turvy. Obviously, my time at Manchester City was was littered with players coming to go. I think there were 56 professionals when I first got there. So it was a conveyor belt and re revolving door of players in, players out. Um, the expectation was massive. It, it, the size of the club blew me away. I know they wasn't playing at the top level, but it was 32,000 every home game at that level was, was frightening. Um, we got relegated and obviously that playoff final is probably what I'm best remembered for at Manchester City. Um, scoring the goal that, that no one really remembers. Um, obviously, Paul Dickoff got the equaliser what I scored. I think my goal was on the 89th minute um, and Dickies was 93rd minute. Um, the two goals actually align unbelievably with, with the QPR and City game where they won the first Premier League title. It's scary, but it was it was a yeah it was a good day and and obviously getting promoted was massive because I think the club would have been in a bit of bother. It seems ridiculous now to think that they were in Division Three, doesn't it? I mean, I I think you know younger fans would think what they were in Division Three. No, I know. But older fans would say, "Would well, you know what? We've been with this club through thick and thin." And I think that's all you can say as a football fan, isn't it? Yeah, they're, look, they're incredible. I, I'm not sure how many other clubs would have had that support. We 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 took them to the depths. Right. And I don't mean that dis disrespectful to the, to the division we, we dropped into. This, this was a massive football club with, with like I said, 32,000 sellout every game. Um, they were desperate for us to do well. And, and look, we had players that weren't good enough, things that went against And I'll tell you what was really difficult. We were the big fish in a small pond. So we were going to, to, to clubs that year um, with teams really wanting us to do us over. It was tough and we struggled with it. Um, and it wasn't until Boxing Day, I think, that year, um, we won away at Wrexham. I think we were, were 14th in the division. We won away at Wrexham on Boxing Day and then went on an unbelievable run to get into the playoffs. Um, but it's not until recently I've realised, and we've, I've spoke to Joe well about it, the club were in real big, big trouble. Um, if we hadn't have gone up that year, I don't think we'd have seen the club that we see today. And again, going back to when I left Swindon, I've had people come up to me and said, oh, thank you for sticking around. Oh, it just blows my mind. What do you mean? Um, well, you, you could have left when we went down. No, no, hang on a minute. I was, part of, I was part of that problem. I was at the football club when it went down, so I'm not walking away until I'm told to leave. Um, but I'm glad I did. I'm glad I stuck around. It was, it was an unbelievable season that season. Again, winning the playoffs is better than anything, going up in the playoffs. Um, and it was, yeah, it was good times of my career being at Manchester City. Um, Right. This is uh, how was it training? This is from Matt. How was it training and playing with Georgie Kinkladzi? Because he was a unique talent, wasn't he? Wow. Obviously, I, I'd seen the brilliance of, of 
Glenn Hoddle and, and Mickey Hazard at Twindon. George, Georgie was right up there. He was, uh, and in my opinion, I did an interview actually um, for Manchester City. I think they're doing a tribute to Georgie uh, and, a, and a video. He, he, he could get in today's squad, in my opinion. He, he really could. He was a genius. He was, his balance, his, his football understanding, his, his qualities, he, he just had everything. He, he could have definitely got into Manchester City squad now, today. And that's saying so with all the stars they got. Yeah, he didn't definitely. say a lot. He didn't say a lot, Georgie. He was quite quiet. And he, he, he probably knew more English than he let on. Um, but he was a genius. To, to watch him in five sides in training, he would just get the ball off the keeper, go through everyone and, and score and walk back smiling. It's, it's funny, actually. A good story about Georgie, actually. I, I always promised myself um, as a kid that once I'd sort of made it and established myself as a footballer and that I could afford it, I'd buy myself a Porsche 911. So it wasn't good timing, I must admit. Manchester City was struggling a little bit. I tried to get myself a 911, a back one, it RS, unbelievable it was. So obviously I took it to the game on Saturday. Frank Clark got wind of it. He wasn't happy. He was going, who did that Porsche? Battered me, battered me. But on Sunday, I'm, I'm at home. I'm, I'm with the, the, the kids in the garden, um, playing in the garden. I heard this revving up of a car, and I'm thinking, someone nicking my Porsche. What's that? So I've ended up running through the house, out onto the front drive, and who is it? It's Georgie Kinkladzi in a bright red convertible Ferrari. <laughs> and he said to me, he said to me, he went, you buy Porsche? I get Ferrari. And it made me laugh because he was right. No, I was never a Porsche. Um, but he was certainly a red Ferrari. So, look, as, a, as a footballer, he was, he was top notch. Um, from there then, I, I, I'm just going to read a couple more comments. Um, this is from Dan. If only some of the players we have at the moment had Kevin's commitment and desire, we'd be fine. Um, from Matt, didn't you score in an away game in Germany for Northern Ireland? No. I, wish, I was near. I, do you know what? I was desperate to say yes. Then um, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't actually score an international goal, and it's, it's something that bugs me because obviously I was quite a free scoring midfielder. When, when I played for Northern, I always played left back. Generally, I played the odd game in midfield, um, and I didn't. I, I, well, I did. I put ball in the net once. I think it was away to Armenia or something like that. Um, header it was, but it got disallowed, and, and oh. I was fuming. I was fuming because the person that fouled was Ian Dowie. I sort of went in the back of Ian Dowie, but he gave a free kick as if I was watching, but it was one of my own players, which it bugged me a little bit. So I remember playing in one game where I had a number of chances as well when I played in midfield for Northern Ireland, but I never got an international goal. And I very nearly lied and said yes, then. I went along with that. I would have gone <laughs> scoring away to Germany would have been all right, wouldn't it? It would have been. And uh, yes, indeed. I wouldn't, I, and honestly, I wouldn't have checked the records afterwards just to make sure that you were right or not. I'd have let you <laughs> end that one. That's right. Uh, this is from Kerry. Uh, following the 25 year celebrations in the Legends Lounge a few years ago, it was obvious you've aged the best. So there you were. There's a compliment for you. Uh, that's another call. I'll, I'll, I'll keep them coming and compliments. This is, I don't know. Yeah, people do say that. I've, I've got better looking as I've got older. I well, somebody said, on, somebody said on Twitter when we said we were interviewing you today, are you interviewing Kevin or Ross from Friends? Do you often get uh, is, is it is it me aging well or is is it them their <laughs> eyes getting worse? I don't know. I don't know. I'll take it anyway. Fair enough. Uh, right from Manchester City, then back to West Ham for three hundred thousand uh, pounds. Glenn Roder was the manager, and then uh, Alan Pardew takes over. I'm not saying any more, but uh, it didn't quite work out for you there, did it? No. Uh, and looking back, the worst decision I ever made um, in football, in my football career. Look, it was it was a tough one because I had two years left. I would just signed a, a three year deal at Manchester City under Kevin Keegan, um, and I was a year into that. I had two years left. The club was evolving at a real rapid pace. They were signing top players: Nico Sanelka, Robbie Fowler, George Ware. These players were coming in were taking Manchester City to the next level. I played a lot the previous season. I'd, I'd got a uh, runner-up in the power of the year. It was really, probably individually, a really good season for me. Um, I just felt unsure whether my time had come to an end at Manchester City, if I'm truly honest. Um, and then, obviously, West Ham coming in for me, I decided to leave. Um, I, I think it was right for the football club. I know that might sound really weird, and I've, I've said it in a previous interview, 
I could have stuck around at Manchester City and, and, and I would have been on financially a lot, lot more money. But I just thought, you know what? The time is right for me to leave the club. It's, it's right for the club, 100%. There was a young Joey Barton coming through as well. Um, and Kevin Keegan said, look, I don't want you to leave, but you might not play as much as you have last season. And I respected that. And I just thought, you know what? I'll cut my losses. And am I going to get an opportunity to ever play for West Ham? I didn't the first time around. So, yeah, I took a massive pay cut and signed for West Ham. But it just, yeah, they say you should never go back, don't they? And that was certainly a time when that, that statement was true. Uh, Michael Carrick was in that squad, I think, of course, who was on loan at Swindon for a brief time. Not in your time, obviously, but uh, as a very young player. Did you notice the potential in him? Yeah, I ended up quite good friends with Michael, actually. He lived around the corner for me. Um, and, it, yeah, he was unbelievable. He, he's just one of them players, and I think he looked like it all the way through his career. But from that young age, I looked at him, and he, he, he always looked comfortable, which tells me, technically, he's unbelievable. But he always looked like he had time. But I used to look at him and think, oh, I wish I looked like that playing football. He just looked elegant and he, he always had time so his awareness was good, his, his technical ability and obviously he went on to, to have an unbelievable career and rightly so, he was a top, top player. Yeah, obviously learned everything at Swindon in that loan spell because he, he looked class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he did look class when he was there. Unbelievable. Uh, right. Uh, lots more coming in. Um, one or two on the subject of management. Well, obviously you went to other clubs you went to Ipswich, Doncaster, Scunthorpe and Mansfield. This uh, from Philip. Was there any chance of return to Swindon before you signed for Doncaster? No. no. I wouldn't. Look, I, I would have walked back to Swindon if there was an opportunity to go back to Swindon. And, and I'm a little bit gutted by it because I never really, I've, I've never been back to, to Swindon. I've never, I, I never got to, after I left, I never got back to play at the county ground. Um, to say goodbye, you sort of just leave. But quite often, as a player, you you get an opportunity to return as as a as opposition player. But I never did. I never come back to the county run. Um, so look, let me tell you now: if if Swindon had, uh, have asked me to go there, I would have walked there. What a shame they didn't. Um, right. I'm not skirting over the other clubs you play for, but then you did get into management. Of course, you you also. Uh, help with management of the Northern Ireland under 21 team, didn't you? So, um, you know, how did your grounding in management come about? Because your playing days are coming to an end, I guess, and you want to stay in the game. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's, normally, and not with Kevin Orlock, it didn't. I, I was naive enough to, to think I was going to play forever. I didn't plan for the future, I'll be totally honest. And obviously, there's a lot more help now. and and players get a little bit of guidance and, and to be fair, they get a lot more money now so they probably don't have to do anything after football but I just thought I was going to play forever and it sort of, I come to the end of my career I, I, I was at Doncaster, got a really, well I had two really bad injuries which I was lucky enough not to get early on in my career and um, I went to Mansfield to try and get fit and couldn't and it sort of just come to an end and I, I was sat at home for, I don't know, probably two years thinking, what am I going to do now? I, I, I sort of sat and played Xbox for a bit and I was rubbish at that, and and I, I, I had no, I had no ambition or desire to go into to management or coaching at that time. I'll be totally honest. I, I sat indoors. My missus was probably getting bored of me being at home, and thought, and I thought, what am I going to do now? I didn't earn enough money to to not have to work. What do I know? Um, and that was quite a quick answer. The only thing I knew was football. So I started up coaching. Um, children in schools, doing football clubs. I, I was obviously at this time at, at Needham Market, so I was unable to play professionally, but I joined Needham Market, which is an unbelievable football club, and I'm still here now, sat in here now. Um, yeah, tell us about Needham Market, because it's a lovely name, first and foremost. You, you, you were also at Moulded and Tiptree. You seem to have a, a, a yeah, liking so for decent names. <laughs> yeah, so base, basically, obviously I started coaching the kids, and then I was playing at Needham still, non-league. So I was able to train once a week and play on a Saturday, which worked for me at non-league. So um, Needham Market was my local club or local-ish club. Um, so I signed there and and loved the place, loved the place. And that was when really um, my coaching and management probably started because the, the manager then, Danny Laws, made me assistant manager. Um, and so that's where it started. It wasn't something that I sort of planned to do. It was something that sort of just evolved. Um, yeah, I was at Needham. We started an academy yeah, many years ago. Um, but at this time, I then moved back to Kent. 
or Kent, London. Um, so the travelling was quite difficult. I was travel travelled up for two years. It was about three hour round trip, um, but it just become too much. So that was when I left Needham. Um, I managed Chatham down there um, where I lived, and then funny enough, I didn't actually apply for it. My daughter sent in my CV because um, obviously when I left Needham, I didn't leave for another job. Like I said, I I never ever. I'm never unhappy. If, if I'm enjoying what I'm doing, I'm never asking to leave and looking for the next thing. Um, so the only reason I left Needham was because the travelling was just too much. I was spending so much time away from the family and, and, and it was tiring driving up and down. So it wasn't fair on the football club or me to continue. So I, I left Needham with no job. So that was when I did um, Chatham for a little while. And then Northern Ireland asked me to be their assistant with the 20, under 21s, which it was called then. Um, that, that come about about by chance i was doing my a license out in in belfast and they obviously like what they see and then asked me to do it so that's sort of where that started and then uh, my daughter put my cv in for the job at colchester which was under 18's assistant um which i ended up getting an interview for and getting so then i moved back to essex which is further up towards um where i lived previously Three and a half years at Colchester, under 23s. I ended up leading the under 23s and alongside that, doing more than Tiptree. And then I, I got the phone call that I was hoping I would get one day, maybe not as quick. I got a phone call from um, Rob Peace, that was Needham Market Academy director, asking if I would go back to Needham Market. And again, I, look, people raised eyebrows. People said I must be mad leaving a League Two under 23 South Wing Cultures to go back to Needham Market, but I, I followed my heart. Like, I, I loved my time at Needham and, and I didn't really want to leave the first time around. So I had unfinished business and I knew I knew the people, I knew Rob well where I'd, I'd worked with him previously. So I knew what, what they were doing at Needham was, was good. They've got a really established academy, facilities second to none, and I wanted to be part of it. So yeah, here I am, sat in the office now. Uh, not playing football though. That's the problem, of course, for many at the minute. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. It is really tough. We've got 70 students. Um, I'm a academy manager, so I've got 70 students to look after in the football provision, along with the first team manager. I'm, I'm the first team manager as well now. So, yeah, it's tough. I've only been first team manager for a little while, but we've we've started really well and the lads have bought into what I'm after. And, yeah, it's, it's tough. Will we play again this season? I don't think so. I think they're waiting on the, on the announcement from um, Boris. Um, to see where we go with it, but I've, I've, I've got a feeling it would probably be null and void, unfortunately. Yeah, shame for many people, of course, uh, but I think we kind of, we understand what's happening. Uh, right, this is uh, <laughs> from Tracy, the two questions from Tracy, really. Uh, do you keep in touch with Swindon players uh, from the past? And can you please start walking back to Swindon now? You could do a job for us. Uh, this is from Matt. I'll pick. I'll go pick Kevin up as soon as possible. And from Dan, come back and manage the town. Would that be an ambition of yours one day? I don't know. I, like I say, I, I'm always happy with where I'm at. I, I love my, being at Needham, is, and I've said to him, um, I, I won't leave until I'm sacked. Who, who knows? Look further down, I know one knows what, what's happened. Swindon's special to me, but I'm loving it and need them. So I'm going to have to, um, at this point, say no to that. But who knows? And what about keeping in touch with Swindon players? It's tough, isn't it? I have over the years, obviously I left a long time ago now. I, I've spoke to Eddie Murray, Mark Robinson. Um, I spoke to Ian Colvouse actually more recently because he was um, we were speaking about a player. He's obviously um, in non-league at the minute himself. At Kings Lynn, which isn't too far away from where I'm sat. So, other than that, not me. I'll tell you one who I speak to, sorry, more than than most now is is, is Dean Hooper. Um, Twinham fans probably won't know too much about Dean. Obviously, he came into the football club from non-league, um, and and wasn't about long. But he's an unbelievable person. I, I, I wish I was I was friends with him back then. If I'm totally honest, um, he's a real good fellow and does lots for charity, which. I've done bits with him, but he's probably the only one I speak to regular now. Well, Kevin, it's been an absolute joy. I've got through lots of questions. Uh, Chris will come back on in a second and maybe put one or two more. But thank you very much. I mean, it's only been an hour. We could have chatted all night, quite frankly. Um, yeah, it's flown by. It's flown by. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is. I, I, we've done a lot of these. And I think we've had as much reaction 
before doing it about you than any other person I can remember. So you are very fondly regarded at Swindon Town. And let me tell you that. Oh, that pleases me because, like I said, it, it is a very special football club to me. They give me my chance. Um, uh, the people were unbelievable. The supporters took to me. And like I said, I've still got family down there. So it, it's, it's second home to me. I don't, look, as a footballer, you, you end up travelling around. I'm not sure where my home is anymore because obviously I've, I've, I'm a London lad. I moved to Swindon, went to Manchester for a long time. I went to York. I've, I've been a bit of everywhere. So I don't really know where my actual home is. But Swindon would be right up there if I had to decide where home is. Well, Chris, welcome back. I know we had lots and lots of questions, oh. didn't we? I mean, I don't know if you've managed to pick one or two. We had loads. Get to. <laughs> <laughs> loads of questions. And I think you've done very well, Vic, and managed to get through most of them. Um, there was just one. What was your lasting memory from the Premiership season? My lasting memory? Wow, let's think. Lasting memory of the Premiership season. Do you know what? Look, there was there was good moments. There was good moments, but me being me, the lasting moment is going to be that five nil. I know it was the last game of the season, but I think we went into it with with the mindset: look, let's not concede hundred goals. Um, and the fact that yeah. we did, I can't get rid of that out of my head for some reason. Because uh, uh, the, yeah. the point is that many people will point to that and say you must have been the worst Premier League team. In history, but you weren't by a long shot. Well, you? you got 30, 32 points, I think, if I remember rightly. And you know, that that's not a bad total. It's not the you know, it's not the greatest total in the world, obviously. But you look at other teams who've got four let far less. Yeah, and I think that, that there might be less this year. I, I think it's one it's difficult to take. And I know it sounds it was compliments, but, but everyone enjoyed watching us. Um but beating us. That that was the problem. We were good to watch, we were entertaining, um, there was always goals for and against. Yeah, that, I just, I just, it just didn't sit well with me. Everyone said, oh, it'd be great to, to watch that Swindon team. But, but, look, um, yeah. which obviously, I wish was different. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Ron, well, there we are. Yeah. I think that's just about it, isn't it, Chris? We've run it. Um, this is it. from Anthony. Thank you very all, much. all the best no for the Needham Market FC, Kevin. This is from Anthony. So, there you go. An yeah. extraordinary uh, career. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, you just think back and, there are various names in Swindon's history that people will tell her, but talk about. But, you know, that was a little spell where you experienced the ups and downs of football, didn't you? The real ups and downs. Yeah, proper roller coaster, And it was, it, it sort of gave me the grounding. I, I see everything. Like from the moment I, I, I walked in, I knew it was a special football club. It, it was, it was family driven. It was just, a, it was just a special time for me. It was, oh, of course there was, there always is in football, unfortunately, but I, I'll always, when I think of Swindon, I'll always think happy things and, and fond memories. Thank you very much, Brilliant. Kevin. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Kevin. Me. No problem. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Okay. So that's it for tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. And we will see you next week for a Monday night panel. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>